everybody. This is Krista Holman's Neurodivergent Rebel. He and I'm here with Paul Austin, and we are going to dive in and have a little chat because uh, Paul and I were talking about uh, the importance of having awesome allies and how you can be a good ally to autistic and neurodivergent people. And Paul had some really good questions, so I thought today uh, we would dive in together and you know, I would I would get down to some of the bottom of you know questions and help 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 Paul out here with with these with, with this uh, idea he had. Awesome, <laughs> thanks so much for uh, having me, Krista. Um, like they say on call-in shows, you know I'm a, a big follower of yours, a first-time caller, <laughs> long-time listener, and I really appreciate you taking the time to work with me. So, my first question is. Is in my business here at IBM and in other places, I want to be a friend to neurodivergent people. So what are some of the first big things you can tell me to do to make that a successful adventure? Yeah, I think the big, one of the big ones, you know, really is listening. Um, when a lot of autistic and neurodivergent people, you know, we, we were trying to either come out or share things. Uh, sometimes, you know, people really don't stop and listen to what we're actually trying to say. They get, you know, like, oh, I know what you're talking about, or everyone has a little bit of that, or, you know, their, their first instinct can be like, well, you know, isn't everyone a little bit autistic, or, you know, oh, or, or the gut instinct can be to try and comfort and say, oh, I never would have guessed. Um, and they're not listening. They're just, maybe they're feeling uncomfortable, and they're, it's feeling awkward, so they don't know how to deal with this information, so they're like, full oh, silence with something, and they almost always say all the wrong answers. Uh, so I was like, okay, you know, what, what, wait and see what that actually means for the autistic person when they come out to you and say, hey, I'm autistic or hey, I'm neurodivergent. Uh, because every neurodivergent or autistic person you talk to has a very different experience of what that means to them, depending on a lot of factors in their life. This may be something that they actually feel is a gift to them, but they may also feel uh, on the other end that it could be like a big curse and it makes their life more difficult uh, and those feelings are very intimate and very personal uh, and so I think the biggest most important thing is not to make assumptions uh, and really realize you are meeting an individual uh, and it, we're not you know that don't don't get hung up on all those stereotypes and the preconceived notions that are really common unfortunately yeah what strikes me about it is it's a lot like the emergence of LGBTQ folk over my lifetime you know when you first met a gay person, it was always like, oh, yeah, I know a gay person or I got a gay friend or, oh, you're gay, so you must do this, right? You must wear funny clothes or you must be able to dance better than the rest of us or choose better colors, right? There, there are so many parallels. We could almost honestly do an entire video just talking about the parallels between the autism and neurodiversity movement and the, and the gay pride LGBT movement. Uh, you know, when you think about it even, you know, back as far as, you know, in, our, in, in, you know, in many of our lifetimes, not my lifetime, but in you know, your lifetime probably uh, being, being gay was pathologized in the DSM, but it was a medical condition. Yep. Uh, and now, you know, we've seen that come out of the book and, you know, we had, uh, you know, gay conversion therapy with a treatment and, you know, uh, we, we've got similar things with autism um, that, you know, still are thought of as okay. And so it's really interesting to see those parallels being played out again and again, uh, whereas, you know, you know, autistic people, it is very similar. We have the autistic pride movement. It's like, you know, we're here, we're autistic, get used to it. Almost like, you know, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. It is like Excellent, similar. Yeah. And, as, as someone who is in both camps, you know, I'm an autistic and a queer person, it's like I, I'm always, like, blown away by the similarities. Uh, but at the same time, it hurts a little bit to see how behind we are. Uh, and when you compare the two movements, uh, you know, we're, we are probably 20 or 30 years behind that, the gay movement, I would think. Um, but, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe I'm catastrophic. But, you know, for example, you know, if I come out and say, hey, I'm autistic, um, you know, people don't know how to respond to that. And they probably will say the wrong thing. Whereas, like, if I came out and said, hey, I'm gay, like, you wouldn't be like, no, you're not, or I don't believe you, or I couldn't tell. <laughs> you would not say any of these things. Most people yeah. know that's totally wrong. Um, so we've got a long way to go, unfortunately. Well, we'll stick that. Uh, topic in our back pocket for another conversation we can have. Maybe do a second one of these videos. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> okay. 
Um, one of the things I'd like to ask is, you know, I've met a, and worked with a lot of different autistic people. And uh, one of the things I noticed is they can be very intense. How do I deal with intensity? Oh, that's a, that's a good one because I am an intense person. Um, and I, I can be very direct and I might not be the person you want to ask like for an opinion if you're like you know you know like you said stereotypical like don't just not just just make me look fat like i'm probably gonna say yeah you know i you know i, I might know now as i've grown older to not say that but my instinct is to be open and honest with you so um that's when people know me that can be something people come to me for honest feedback but you know people don't know me and aren't expecting that intensity and they they're maybe a little bit more sensitive and they come to me looking for maybe support and they come to me and ask a question and i'm going to give them a very intense direct honest answer um you know realize you, that's don't, do it, you don't do it with malice it's just no. honesty it, it's just very honest you know it is just honesty um because i would rather people approach me with honesty than uh, sugarcoating things because I am confused by that. Honestly, I don't, I don't pick up on all that sugarcoating. It's like, just tell me how it is. I just need to, I just spell it out for me, you know? Uh, and I know like I am all over the place. You, you guys, if you haven't, if you don't know me or if you're new and you'll know by the end of this video, I can be a lot and I can really be like too much for some people. Um, those often are not my people, I'm finding out, you know, but, uh, you know, I wish, I wish people would let me know when I'm being too much, um, whatever that means to them, because uh, a lot of times, and I'm getting used to it, um, you know, now, but people will just silently slink away, and they don't say anything, they just ghost me, and then I don't get an explanation, it's just like, there's no opportunity to correct my behavior or to figure out what I did wrong or did I accidentally offend someone. It's just like, oh, okay, there's no benefit of the doubt. It's just, okay, I guess I messed that one up. Uh, instead of that upfront and really honest communication, uh, people can be blunt with me. You know, people, I wish people would be blunt with me. Um, it's interesting you know, that you say that because um, I remember John Elder Robeson talking at one of the Autism at Work summits and he said, if we're doing something wrong, tell us, tell us what the proper behavior you expect is, and we can do that. We can learn that. And we can do it forever. We're that easy. But people don't yeah. want to cross that bridge. Why is that? The dancing around it. I, I don't know. And it's like, I feel like as autistic people, like, you know, we're always stretching our communication style to accommodate not autistic people. Uh, and it'd be nice if, you know, they would do a little bit of the stretching too. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we all have different communication styles. You know, autistic people aren't the only people who are direct communicators. Uh, Non-autistic people can be direct communicators, too. Uh, so it's like finding that, like, meet in the middle, uh, you know, because I, I do modify my own communication in order to meet people who I know uh, are need a little bit more stuff. But now that's because I'm obsessed with communication. And so studying communication, autistic, non-autistic, and beyond has become one of my obsessions since I was diagnosed autistic. And I was like, oh, you have a communication deficit. I'm like, I'll show you. I'll learn everything about communication. <laughs> you know, in my 30s, I'm learning about communication. Um, but, you know, it, it's been really beneficial. But not everybody has those tools. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of stretch going on. And it's not evenly proportioned, unfortunately. Okay. Another topic I'd like to discuss is about meltdowns. I hear a lot about meltdowns. I know people confuse them with kids throwing tantrums or people just being emotionally unstable. Explain to me what a meltdown is and how I can help someone who's having a meltdown. Yeah. Uh, and so first, I think it's really the most important thing is to clarify what a meltdown is uh, because people hear meltdowns and they think tantrums. Uh, and those are two very, very different things. And so, you know, a tantrum is what we think of with the little children on the floor screaming and crying because they want to get their way. And that last part, that underline that there. Um, it's easier to spot in children because, you know, they're, they're doing this for attention. They want something. They're trying to get an outcome, you know. And so a tantrum, you know, they might stop if nobody's paying attention to them or, you know, it's if you, if, you know, they, they get with them all, all of a sudden they're happy again or whatever. Whereas an autistic meltdown, although it might look like a tantrum, the motivations and the reality behind what's happening is very, very different. Uh, so, for example, you know, a meltdown, it really is beyond the autistic person's control. It is 
my brain is overwhelmed and I can't, I just can't take anymore. I'm just, I literally can't handle anything else. And so they might, you know, start crying or fall to the floor because they're just, they're just mentally done. They're completely overwhelmed. Uh, their fight, flight, freeze response has been triggered. It's a, almost like a panic attack kind of a feeling. It's a horrible feeling. You know, you can also shut down and just implode on yourself instead of having an outward meltdown where you may just, it's all internal and all of that is. All of that ugliness that you would see lashing out on the outside, you are lashing out on the inside at yourself, which a shutdown can honestly be worse and more painful for a physical person. At least with the meltdown, you have a bit of a catharsis at the end. It can feel better. Um, but the meltdown, it's not fun. It's not under the control of the autistic person. So the person you know, who's, who's experiencing that, uh, they, they're no longer able to fully access all of their cognitive thinking, you know, their, their adrenaline is pumping, and they're just overwhelmed. It's like an eruption. And it's, it's embarrassing. You know, when I have a meltdown, I'm probably, like, if I feel it coming, I'm going to run to the bathroom, you know, hide somewhere alone, because I don't want anybody to see me. I'm not doing this for attention. It, attention is literally the last thing I want or I'm looking for. Um, and as a kid, you know, I just needed some time alone to calm down and breathe. But, you know, if people would keep interacting with me and keep amping me back up, it would be worse. And I wouldn't be able to calm because really you just need to, like, calm your brain down and calm down and get over it. It's like riding a roller coaster. You've just got to get to the end of it. Um, and you don't have control over when it stops. Uh, and that, that's a, a really big difference, too, between that, that tantrum. Um, and, you know, like telling someone, oh, calm down, calm down, calm down. You know, like I said, like, I need to kind of go away and calm myself down. But if someone's, like, sitting there over me yelling at me to calm down, like, this is, like, the opposite of what I need. And it's completely unhelpful. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely some things to do to help. Like, telling someone to calm down is the least helpful thing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work with my Ever. wife. <clears throat> or anybody. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not good advice. You got to find out some way to help them uh, get away from the stimulus that's overloading them or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to my next question, which is about stimming. Um, the thing I find fascinating about stimming is that I think everybody does it. You know, some people drum their fingers on their cup. Other people snap their fingers. You know, they. Oh, yeah. my, my sister used to bounce her leg constantly when we were kids. And I met an autistic woman who got hired by uh, our company who every now and then would just push her chair away from the table, walk a circle around the room, and then sit down. So what is stimming, and why can't people just get over it? <laughs> yeah, I don't, well, but, you know, I, you are on to something. Everybody stems to some degree, and that's the, that extends beyond humanity, like animals kind of stem too, you know, like dogs. And if you see animals in the zoo, they'll pace pacing, like you're saying, to get up and pace around them. I will get up every now and then and just pace back and forth uh, next to my table here where I'm working. Um, but autistic people, we stim more frequently than the general population. And it almost for us is, well, it is for us often a very essential part of just how we regulate and experience our world where I try to be still, I can be still, but then all of a sudden, I was going to try and be still and talk to you. I, just, I, can't, I can't even keep my train of thought, like when I'm trying to be still. It's just, it takes so much mental focus to like try and be still. Even if I look like I'm being still right now, like my top half might be still, but my leg is probably doing this wild thing under the table. I'm sitting crisscross applesauce in a chair right now, like with my knees, like butterfly bouncing, like the entire time. I look like I'm being perfectly still right now. Like, let me, so my hands are down. And you think I'm being perfectly still, but my legs are flapping like a little bird under the table. You have no idea. You know, we've learned to do these things that are socially acceptable, uh, but for autistic people, it's really necessary. And movement in general, I feel, is more necessary for me. I get really dysregulated if I'm using my brain a lot, all that intense brain power, and I'm not physically moving enough to get the body energy out to match that. I'll get to where at the end of the day, I feel like, my body has so much energy that it's on almost like electricity racing through it, and it's a horrible feeling. But my brain is just zonked out like zombie. I have nothing left in my brain. And it is the worst feeling ever when it's like you're so amped physically, but your brain is done, toast. 
Uh, and so, like, I make an effort to go out and move and walk around and swim and do yoga and do physical things. I have to make a purpose to do that or let my body stim uh, to counteract just everything else I'm doing. And when I don't, I find that my health suffers in other ways. My sleep cycle can be disrupted. All of these things that kind of plagued me my whole life, but before I knew I was autistic and understood more about just how autistic brains and neurology works, I had no idea, and I was totally neglecting myself. Um, so it's, it's come a long way, like, learning all of this. <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder if we're all born neurodivergent, but some of us are beaten into neurotypicality. Um, one thing I've noticed as a manager working with neurodivergent people is um, you guys like to talk and talk about something you know well. And I'm a person I'm a person who's concerned with time, with schedules, not really, but I, I have to pretend I am for this conversation. But, you know, I'll get into a meeting with somebody and I've got half an hour and I get someone who takes 29 minutes of it talking about one thing. How do I keep people from running away from my meeting, running away with my meeting? Yeah, well, I, I do want to note uh, that autistic people are probably just as likely to hold back in meetings and not know when the good time to speak up is and not yeah. speak up at all, because I've been that person, too, in the meeting. Uh, but, you know, when hosting meetings, I think it's really important you know, just not, not just with autistic and neurodivergent employees, because uh, when I work with businesses, I tell them that a lot of the things that I recommend they do in working with autistic and neurodivergent employees are actually universally good for the workforce as a whole. Uh, so when having meetings, it, it's better to set, you know, same ground rules for everyone in the meeting. Make sure there are clear ground rules uh, for everyone, not just the neurodivergent employees. You know, say, you know, we've had meetings where if ever someone is getting off track on a topic too long, uh, with peer-to-peer -peer accountability, anyone in the room can call a squirrel or off track or whatever your magic stop sign word is. You make up, this is a stop sign word for the meeting. Anyone can call this out if we're getting off track. And this is, you know, and this is like a universal meeting. It's not just for one employee. Um, you know, sidebar, or we can say, you know, when we have um, our, our meetings, we run them on EOS uh, in the company I work for, and so if there's something that we need to talk about later, we'll drop it down uh, to drop down later to discuss as a team if it's relevant, or we can say sidebar and two people can take it offline and talk about it later. Uh, but it's like having that accountability where people say, hey, you know, we're, we're getting off track. And then the other thing is, too, having a schedule and an outline and agenda for your meeting. Like really, you know, as when you're preparing the meeting as a leader, do the groundwork and set out the outline. And even if you can prepare in advance and the outline to your team and say, these are the topics we're going to go over in today's meeting. And you go over those items and when they're done, you're done with the meeting. You don't, you know, even if the meeting is early uh, and you don't extend your meeting unless you say, hey, everyone, you know, we aren't done yet. We still have these other items. Can everyone stay? And you check in with your team. It's all about, you know, having really uh, clear expectations and communication and really setting up and structuring the meeting really well um, is, is the most important thing, too, because it, any employee is going to take that away and run away with your meeting if you don't have structure. There's going to be someone in there who's going to say, okay, well, we've got empty time. Let's fill the time with talking, and they'll do it. <laughs> Yeah, that actually sounds like great advice for any meeting, whether it's neurotypical, mm -hmm. neurodivergent, or mixed. Um, and I notice a lot of people just don't follow those kinds of things. They don't take the time to think ahead about what the goal of the meeting is, what the purpose, put together some sort of structure to it. And, uh, you know, I like structure. I like it when meetings end on time. So I can get to lunch and things like that. But uh, I think that's great advice. Like a lot of things about dealing with neurodivergent people is is, is good for anybody. You know, all of these things yeah. make good practices for dealing with all of your employees, all of your friends, all of your whatever, your relatives. So the next question I have, you have an, in, it, I'll confess that we have some answers ahead of us here and questions written down, but um, mm -hmm. I, I liked your answer to this next one. And, and that is, are we really that different? I mean, I, I confess to having certain stims. I drum on my thing. I have specific deep interests like other people. I dislike some sensory assaults. Does this mean I'm autistic if I stim, have sensory problems, don't like to socialize, or am I just antisocial and introverted? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, like I shared this before, you know, autism, it really is a yes or a no answer. 
just like being pregnant, you are pregnant or you're not pregnant. Uh, there's no in between, autistic or not autistic. But, you know, there, there, there are a specific set of criteria a person has to hit in order to be diagnosed autistic. And you can't just have one or two or a few of the traits. You really have to hit all of the boxes. Uh, because, you know, autistic is genetic, though. Um, autistic traits are found everywhere throughout humanity. So it does make sense that people might have one or two autistic traits, or a lot of parents of autistic kids will look at themselves once they go through the diagnostic process with their kid and say, you know what, this, a lot of this fits me. Or some people are missed growing up. They may not be diagnosed because their parents fit all the boxes, but were doing so well in life and had good coping skills. Uh, because, you know, autism isn't actually usually diagnosed uh, it's in the diagnostic criteria that you have to be struggling in life. So, you know, when I was struggling and I was not feeling well and I was sick from autistic burnout in a, in a previous uh, employer, it led me to being diagnosed. Uh, and that was because I was struggling. Unfortunately, the mental health DSM medical model is basically a list of what an autistic person is in distress, and it describes an autistic person kind of in a crisis situation. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, I don't think anybody knows really hardly what an autistic person in good mental health looks like. We don't have that model. It doesn't exist. Um, so autistic people in good mental health are probably completely missed. Um, also, though, I really, I do, I feel like I need to say this, uh, if you really, really, really relate to being autistic in a deep way, uh, you might want to research the criteria, the specific criteria, more deeply. Um, because in my experience, uh, and I said this myself before I was diagnosed, when I met my first autistic person, I didn't know any better. I said it in my head, thank goodness, not out loud. I said it. Well, doesn't everybody experience that? Or I think everybody has that. You know, there's no everybody's a little bit autistic. Those people often although they don't know it themselves, a lot of them might be autistic. Interesting. So, you know, I, I'm not qualified to make that call, but it is worth, you know, looking into more deeply and maybe investigating if, if it really resonates that strongly with you. Um, and, you know, maybe not. You know, maybe there's, there's a lot of other things that are similar and could create similar experiences as well. Um, you know, neurodiversity is not just autistic people. A lot of my ADHD friends, we have very similar experiences and neurological profiles. Some of them even have sensory issues, uh, and they're, they have stimming, too, what they call it fidgeting in the ADHD community. Uh, so there, there's overlap and a lot of nuances there. And neurodiversity, you know, it's, it's a really broad spectrum. Awesome. Um, on that note, would you say all autistic people are introverts? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, believe it or not, you know, although a lot of us are, and I currently would classify myself that way, I, I've not even always really been an introvert. Um, in fact, I can be really outgoing, you know, when I'm excited about a task or a project or doing you know, doing this right here. I got so excited, I almost threw the tablet across the room. I'm excited. Um, but, you know, like an introvert, I really do need the downtime to kind of go away and recover. But there are definitely autistic people out there who are self-proclaimed extroverts. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're the ones that are going to be out there. They're more sensory seeking. Uh, and, you know, I myself even will be more willing to, like, venture out, venture out when I'm on, like, a sensory seeking mission. Um, but if I'm, you know, it's like if I'm not mentally stimulated, I'm going to get, I need mental stimulation. But if I've been in an environment where I feel like I have too much simulation or I don't need anything and I just need to calm, it's very much the opposite where I come into that avoidant, very much more introverted mode where I'm like, I need to recharge, batteries drain, you know, plug in, stay home, hide. <laughs> okay. Um, do you just want neurotypical people to stay away from you guys? No, 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 actually no, not at all. I really don't. Uh, it's you know, I, I do need time and space and quiet to do my work. But I don't. I don't hate people, um, and the rest of the world, uh, you know, they, they, they seem to operate with a little bit less structure than I personally need. Um, but 
you know that that doesn't that doesn't mean they don't we don't we don't have our place. Uh, it, it would be nice if not that the people would be a little bit more structured, or you know they could be a little more understanding with the and accommodating to autistic people and the way we communicate and operate. Because I feel like a lot of times autistic people we're asked to do all the bending and stretching, like I said earlier, um, and non autistic people sometimes forget like. The, non the autistic way is an okay way to do things too, um, mm -hmm. you know, just because you know we, we do things a little bit differently. It doesn't mean it's the wrong way of doing things. Right. I got one of those questions that's also could be a whole other episode, and that is why does it seem like there's more men or boys who are autistic than females? Why? What is masking all about? Why do females more often get the question, Krista, you don't look autistic to me? Mm -hmm. Society! Anyway, <laughs> yeah, cult yeah, it is a big, it, culture and society has a big influence on that. And especially in you know, Western culture, uh, women and girls, we put a huge pressure on each other from a young age to be socially acceptable and ladylike. It, manners are beaten into us, especially in the South and in Texas, like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, you better not ever say yeah. Like, you, you, you learn these things. You are yeah. trained and you are corrected and they are put into you until they become automatic responses. You're programmed. Uh, and our male counterparts growing up, often they were excused, you know, things like, oh, boys will be boys or, yeah, it was just different. And the other boys don't seem to put that pressure on each other the way other girls do. It's like other girls, like, for some reason, they keep each other in check. They're like, you're a leader. You can't do it. Like, other girls, they can't mind each their own business. They they are all up in your business. Uh, right? You know, and I, I think society teaches them to be that way. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely conditioning. Um, and... It's it's hard, and that it puts autistic people into where they can start masking from a very very young age. And I, I do want to note though that boys and men aren't immune to masking, aren't immune to this, because if that same pressure is applied to young boys, they'll mask up in much the same way. Uh, so it, it just it really just depends, but. You know, there's, there's just often, generally, there's less pressure on, on guys to have all of these manners and be a certain way. But at the same time, there, there can be. Okay. Um, what would you say is neurodiverse people's biggest beef with neurotypical people? I don't have beef, but I think that it, it all comes from miscommunications and misunderstandings, honestly. But the important thing that I think we all really need to realize, like in all seriousness, is that we are all in this here together. We need each other. And neurodiversity, it's it's human diversity, it's biodiversity, it is includes all brain types, and that includes neurotypical and autistic people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, when, when all is all good and synchronistic and harmonistic in the world, you know, high autistic weaknesses, they can be supported especially in the workplace, this is really true, by, you know, an autistic person who doesn't have the same weaknesses I do. Because my weaknesses are, tend to be, because I'm vast minority, are weaknesses that most of my peers don't have. And so it's not that big a deal because someone else has that skill that I don't have, and probably everyone on my team has that skill I don't have. And they can fill those gaps and they can help me and support me. And that's great when it's not like made a problem and I'm not berated for having this weakness that nobody else has. You understand, okay, you know, it's difficult for her uh, and they help. And also on the flip side of that, like I've got some pretty, I like my skills. I'm proud of my skills that I have. And they tend to be skills that are a lot less common and often are high in demand because I tend to be a very specialized um, person. I, I become in a topic, I become all in, and I, I learn everything about it, and I'm really good at being a specialist as long as I love something. And that's kind of anything I fall in love with, that autistic stereotypical thing where, you know, we're all in on the interests. Um, and so it can be a really, really good thing. Uh, but, you know, we have to have that harmony. 
and it, you know, when it works out, it's great. Great. Um, you know, in the industry that I'm in, which is all about computers and technology and programming, um, it's often a selling point to people in charge to say, let's hire some autistic people because they're good at software testing. Let's hire some autistic people because they're good at programming. Is that all they can do or can you do more? You know, it's a big myth that that's all they can do and that's unfortunate. And I think that comes from a lot of us, you know, we do tend to be detailed people. And so those of us who are good at those types of things are really good at like sitting through details and lines of code, but not every autistic person can do that. You know, not, we're not all good at math. Um, you know, we, we have a wide variety of skills, just like non autistic people. You know, like I said earlier, whatever we're passionate about, you know, we, we can, we can dive into it fully and really be good at it. Our skills and ability can vary really greatly from one person to the next. You know, we're not, we're not good with, you know, we may not be good, like I said, with numbers and coding, uh, but we can be artists, we can be teachers, uh, we can be public servants and elected officials even. Um, we, we can even be salespeople and work in customer service, believe it or Lawyers. not. Lawyers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. Okay, can you explain to me why being neurodiverse is not a disability, or is it? Yeah, so it really can be. And like I was saying earlier at the beginning of our chat, it, you know, it depends a lot on what the person's ex individual experience has been. Um, for some autistic people, we, we feel like, oh, this is definitely tied into my strengths and it's, it, you know, it's been good. But, you know, when you ask every person, their answer is going to be different. You know, for example, even with me, uh, when I was working in an office under fluorescent lighting uh, in an open office uh, environment and I didn't have any accommodations in place, I started to become physically ill from the lighting and I was having neurological symptoms. And, you know, because with this one, the, the environment couldn't be adapted to my needs, I couldn't do the job to the best of my abilities. And you know, since then I have moved on and found another job that is better suited to my sensory needs. And you know, my whole life has gotten better and I'm doing better in the workplace. Uh, and and you know, now that I'm accommodated, I'm excelling in work. And when I was unaccommodated, I really was failing. And the work you know, I was producing then, because I always felt horrible and I wasn't my best self, was honestly in comparison to the work I'm doing now not my best work it was you know remedial um, because you know I didn't I couldn't show up and be the best version of myself every day and I I need to be able to give my all I'm I'm an all or nothing kind of a person uh, and so having that support so I can come and I will give and you know I give every ounce that I have every every minute of every day as long as I you know I'm feeling up to it yep. or support and supported <laughs> Great. Well, I hate to sound like I'm trying to wrap this up with a nice bow, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, the thing that I'm hearing is something that I've believed all my life, and that is that everybody's different. Everybody has a different way of thinking. And the more we celebrate that and accommodate each other, the more harmonious things can be. And we all like harmony. I, at least I do anyway. And I like seeing people excel at what they're good at. So from my point of view, you know, doing the simple things to accommodate neurodiverse people, doing the simple things to accommodate some neurotypical people, it helps us bring our best selves to work, as everybody likes to say, or bring their whole selves to work, and it gets more out of people, and that's what we all want. I mean, we all want to be able to execute to our potential, have fulfilling lives and jobs or pursuits or whatever that is, and I really appreciate you taking the time to explain a lot of these things for me, and I hope it benefits your audience and mine. Oh, thank you so much for having these conversations. And good questions are worth their weight in gold, honestly. So this, this was a really, really great, great, Paul. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Krista.